Make yourself comfortable. Did I startle anybody? It's really good to see you guys. What a blessing. Are we ready for this? Take the plunge into the book of Job. You guys ready? Anybody scared? I know Hannah's a little nervous. Well, uh, it is it is an epic book, and thinking correctly about life is so important, and especially when it comes to times of suffering, hardship, disappointment, things like that, to think rightly about our situation really will determine how our, our life goes. As we look into the book of Job, we deal with the, the human predicament, the human condition. The book of Job is the, the earliest writing that we have in all of Scripture. Chronologically, it's not obviously Adam and Eve were before Job, but it is the first written Scripture that we have. The age-old question of suffering, of why bad things happen to good people, the age-old question of good and evil, spiritual warfare, the role of God, the role of Satan, the role of evil, the role of good, all these things are explained in, in the book of Job. And so... As we begin this journey, um, let us take it to the Lord and pray and ask that through this book that he would change our hearts and our minds to be more like him in the end. Father, thank you so much for your love for us, that, that you're good enough to record things that we could have never known on our own, Lord, that you have... Uh, lifted the veil on things that happen beyond the seen world, things that, that explain a lot for us, Lord. And I thank you for, for using Job and all that he went through as an example for us, Lord. And I thank you that, that we have hindsight to apply to our condition now. I thank you that you've revealed truth to us and Lord, as we, as we begin this book, I pray that um, those who are suffering, probably all of us in one way or another, um, I pray that you'd minister to us, Lord, that you'd minister to our hearts, that you'd give us the mind of Christ, that you'd give us the perspective of heaven, that when we face those times of trial, when when evil comes and knocks on our door, tragedy, hardship, disappointment, when it comes and visits us, Lord, that we would be so grounded in your word and so grounded in our relationship with you that you would see us through every and any hardship, trial, and difficulty. And Lord, even for those who fear the future, who fear what may happen, what could happen, those who live in that way, just fearful of things. I pray that through this book, you would give us great comfort in our understanding of these truths behind suffering. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so turn to the book of Job if you're not there already. The book of Job starts the third section in our Bible, uh, the first section of the first five books, we have the Torah, um, the Pentateuch, you can call it different things, the law. We worked our way through those uh, right when we started the church. And then you go into the historical books, which goes from Joshua to Esther, which we just finished last week. And so now we get into the poetry books, which starts with the book of Job and then goes into Psalms. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and so uh, Song of Solomon. So we'll be working our way through the poetical books now. Um, the first couple of chapters of the book of Job are not the poetical part. Those are historical narratives like we've been going through in the historical books. 
Uh, and then we get into the poetry part. Uh, the poetry part, many people um, feel that the book of Job is, is the gold standard for literature, for um, poetry. Hebrew poetry is a little different than our poetry, where uh, uh, Hebrew poetry is more into rhythm and cadence and mixing of ideas and contrast versus rhyming of words. And so that will develop, that will be in these poetical books for a while, so we'll see all that. But we're entering into the just the excellence of literature. But not only is the book of Job literature, it's, it's something that really happened to a real person that gives us, as humans and believers, insight and perspective on what happens between the time we're born and the time that we die. That's the complicated part, isn't it? Before that, everything's great. After that, for Christians, everything's great. But let's, let's face it, uh, life, the predicament that we're in, the fallen world, that we face suffering, and we all are subject to suffering, even if we're Christians, even if we're people who pray, who live by the word, the truth, that we too will be subject to suffering. And so through this book, we get then God's treaty or thesis on suffering. And really the point of this book is not even so much suffering, it's faith. And that's what we find in the last chapter of, of the book. And um, it's going to be a, a while before we get there. So I want to just point out, because some of you may not have time to wait till we get to chapter 42 to find out what to do when we're suffering. But we're calling this, this, this book, we're calling it Hope and Suffering. And so what is the hope when we suffer? What is the hope? What is that? Boy, Job has to wait a long time to find out that answer too. And God seems like he remains on the sidelines for a while. Job in his misery and his hardship is working out his understanding of hardship, and you know what it comes down to the end, when God finally speaks? He says, Job, there are things in this world that you can never understand. There are things that are so complicated, so intricate, so involved and so difficult that there is no way your human brain could comprehend those things. And so in the end, Job, your hope is not so much finding quick solutions to your answers. Your hope is knowing the God who does. And if you're looking for things to get better, know that what you're going through is the better. Because in God's sovereignty, in the complexities of life, that there's something that rises above the dust heap, above the ashes, there's something that trumps every difficult and hardship that we go through, and that is the intimacy and fellowship and relationship with Jesus Christ. See, as we look in the book of Job, we find out that what we value as human beings is a lot different than what God values. And God values 
relationship with him so much so that instead of giving us all the explanations and answers that we often want, instead of that, what he does is allow us to go through transformation in the process of our suffering. So our transformation is a transformation that brings likeness to God. And our likeness to God is what brings closeness and intimacy and fellowship with God, which God sees as the ultimate value in life. And so when, when we look to feel better because we can understand something, when we scramble for answers, and we look in the scriptures and we can't always find exactly what the solution is. And we talk to people, they don't seem to give us the fix. And when we still hurt and God seems like he doesn't care, it seems like he's forsaken us. The book of Job tells us that God is doing something far more valuable than we could ever imagine, think of, and hope for. And so the hope in suffering is that Jesus Christ himself will be more real, more present, closer, and more intimate in our relationship with him. And we have to ask ourselves, is that what we value? Would we be willing to suffer if it meant a deeper and closer relationship with God? That's a hard question to answer, isn't it? And a lot of us don't want to answer that question. And this is what the book of Job is bringing us to. Every book in the New Testament speaks about suffering. And yet, in many Christian circles, in many pulpits, in many books, don't talk about suffering. The Bible says that suffering is promised to those who desire to live a godly life. And the, the first thought is that I don't want to do that. And that's a normal human response. But when we come to find out if, if you have suffered and found Jesus in the suffering, and you find that the suffering is worth it. Because as Apostle Paul said, I would count everything a loss but to know Jesus Christ. So if God values intimacy with us so much, then maybe our, our value system needs to shift a little bit. I've been convicted by this. I've been challenged by this. I've been faced with my own insufficiencies and superficial views of, about life. But I, I know you guys. I know many of the things that you go through, that you face every day. I know your hardships, your troubles, your sufferings, your difficulties. And I know in a, in a room like this that we all understand suffering. And that means that we're all off to a very good start. The book of Job, as he talks about and shows the importance of transformation, we find something really interesting. That there is, there is an absolute need for suffering in order to get closer to God. There's really, without suffering... 
it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to have a very intimate, close relationship with God. And so we see scriptures like, like Paul, who prayed, Lord, take this pain, this thorn, whatever that was, this anguish, take it away from me. And, and God said, what? My grace is sufficient. God saw his grace as more valuable than the removal of whatever it is that was a problem for him. And he said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And so we find these scriptures and we look at people in the Bible and, and we find that there's a fellowship with God in our suffering. And when we understand that, we can come to a place where instead of trying not to suffer, we can relax in the pain and turn to Jesus who says he'll carry us through the pain, whatever ails us, whatever is difficult for us. We know from the book of Job that, that in the end, God restores more than he took away. We can find at the end that it's better than the beginning. The book of James, chapter 5, verse 11, speaks about Job, and it says we, we can admire his endurance or perseverance in the suffering. He was an example of how to suffer. But none of us know how it's going to end. None of us know how our dilemma, our problem is going to work out. The one thing that we know and we have to continue to go to is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. And he is the hope in all our suffering. Chapter 1, verse 1. There is a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. So we have, have a guy who really took serious his faith. When he says he is blameless, it doesn't mean he is perfect. It means that, that he wanted to do the right thing, that he was a moral person, that he considered his relationship with God of utmost importance. Why is, why is this information given to us? This is valuable, isn't it? Because we begin to deal with what often happens in suffering is we, we try to, we ask the question, why? Have you ever done that? Why me? Why, Lord? Why me? And what often happens is, is we can begin to think, what did I do wrong? And there may be certain pastors from certain denominational bents that say if bad things happen to you, it's because of your lack of faith. If you're not well, if you're not rich, if you're not driving a Rolls Royce or a Bentley and wearing great expensive clothes or something, you don't have enough faith. That really makes me angry because I've talked to people whose suffering was taken advantage of by these false teachers, the name it and claim it, prosperity people. Have they read the book of Job? And to, to put condemnation on a person that's hurting and going through some trial. The book of Job, it tells us it's not that simple. It tells us that, that you and I need to be real careful, as we're going to see in the next 37 chapters or so, about the advice we give to people, and about thinking that we know everything that's happening. We need to be very careful about that. And so, 
Job has introduced us basically as there, there's not a more godly man around. That's how he's introduced to us. And that can seem strange to people that he would he would have to suffer because he was godly. But doesn't the Bible tell us that? Blessed are those who suffer persecution, right? So in verse 2, it keeps going on with how blessed he was. He had seven sons, three daughters. Verse 3, his possessions, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that all this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So, he's at a place in his life which I think furthers his character is the fact that he has so much material goods and so many material possessions and yet it hasn't dampened his desire to want to serve God. Don't you think that's interesting? Because usually material possessions and comfort in life bring a coldness towards God. The Bible tells us that. And so this furthers the character of Job. In verse 4 it says, And his sons would go and they would feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And so it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This Job did regularly. So now we, we get a picture of a, of a man who loved God and the activities of that man who loved God was to intercede for his children. Now we, we don't know about these parties, what they were like. It doesn't necessarily mean they were just wild, crazy parties. It could be. But we get this impression that this family was very close. We get this impression that they enjoyed being around each other, that they cared for one another. You think about a, a, a parent having seven kids that love being around each other. What a blessing, right? I mean, you think, wow, that would just be so great. And to have a family that's so close that they actually enjoy being together. That you don't have to force them and they don't dread the holidays. But they just enjoy being around each other. But And, and Job's there and he's... He's saying, Lord, I, I don't know if my kids have uh, sort of forgot about you or if there's something in their heart that's not right. But, Lord, I'm, a, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to make an offering for them. This shows us the importance of a, of a parent being able to let go of their children at the proper age and yet to seek God for them constantly. There's power in that. And to say, you, you know, I, I can't be there with my kids and do everything for them, but I can pray for them. And it seems like that makes a difference. It seems like that's important. That I'm, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to seek God. I'm going to offer for them that, that my prayers to God make a big difference. But we also see this great love that Job had for his family. We see his great desire for him to want to see his kids in a right relationship with God. So in verse 6, we get the act 2 of the play, so to speak. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came along. This is so interesting. 
So we get this picture of Job just being this very upright, morally, God-fearing guy who loved God, he loved his kids. God blessed him with so much material goods. And then there was a day when angelic beings, which that could refer to fallen or non-fallen angelic beings, presented themselves before God. This is so interesting because we get this picture behind the scenes that, that everything that we see is not everything that there is. That if we were able to pull back the veil of the material world that we live in, there would just be this wild spiritual world and activity going on. Sometimes I'm glad I can't see that. Ignorance is bliss, I think, in a lot of cases. But as this play unfolds, notice what happens in verse 7. The Lord says to Satan, so God's initiating a conversation. And he says, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and he said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. Of course, Peter tells us that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. So an understanding of spiritual warfare is that from the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, and now there's a combative relationship in this world. That explains why there's so much challenge to faith. There's so much challenge to spiritual activity and spiritual growth. That Satan is actively pursuing actively looking for prey. But we have to factor in and notice something here that involved in Satan's activity. Notice in verse 8, the Lord says to Satan, he's initiating a conversation, have you considered my servant Job? That's I think all of us think usually, like, why would God do that? Couldn't he just fly under the radar? But it is important to point out that God is initiating this. If God is initiating this, that means this is a good thing, that we are not random victims of suffering and circumstance, but that suffering and pain are allowed into our life by God for a reason. And knowing the nature of God, that reason is only for good because God cannot do anything other than good. God is by his very nature good and cannot do bad. That's very important to understand. Because now we're not just people who become victims of Satan's random attacks. But now we understand that God has a role. Now, I don't want to sound as if that's insensitive, the way I'm portraying that, because... I know things that people have gone through in this room, it's very difficult to see how that could be possible. And I'm not going to explain how some of those things would be possible. I just want us to understand in the scripture that it is true what God says in Romans 8, 28, that all things do work together for good and that suffering and pain and horrific things that happen in our life that, that God uses those for great purposes. And imagine if God didn't have any boundaries on Satan. Imagine what he would do and how long it would take. He would just wipe everyone out immediately. 
But what we have to see here, this is what's so important. And this is the application when we're going through suffering. We have to know that God is controlling everything so that it's a benefit to us. And as Job is our example, it's hard to understand. It's hard to see. And I could never in any way, knowing some of the things that people have suffered in this room, be able to, to explain all that and, and say, because in our minds, in my mind, it's hard to understand. It's hard to think that that could be okay. And in my share of suffering in this world, I don't, I don't understand exactly how and why and when I don't. And so what do I do? I trust God. That's what I do. I understand that when God allows me to suffer, that there's a reason. And the reason is for improvement, for betterment, for enhancement, for growth and development. It's never to take away, to punish, to hurt, if we're a Christian. Because Jesus has borne all our wrath. There's no punishment for a Christian. And so, knowing that, knowing that God is working good, knowing that as I look through the Bible and I see all these people suffer and see how it ends up, see what God does for that, I, I see. I don't understand, but I, I see there's benefit. I see... There's necessity. I see God working through those things in a way that had I not gone through, had I not suffered, that I would not have gotten to a place that I've gotten if I had suffered. And remember, Jesus is always the reward. And so knowing Jesus in a more intimate, close way is what makes a fellowship or what makes the suffering good. So the Lord says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and shuns evil. So it seems like he's being punished for being awesome. But see... And I'm with you. I, I think that, like, wow, is that what he gets for, like, following the Lord and he just gets Satan to attack him? That seems really great. But you know why I think that? Because my value system is wrong. Because what, what God sees is not what I'm seeing. What he values is not what I value. And so every time I go through something I don't like and my response is, is not correct, is not trusting, is not thankful, is, is not good, then I know my value system is wrong. When we look at the life of Apostle Paul, we see all that suffering he goes through. And we say, oh, he's my favorite guy in the Bible. I just love Paul. But we don't want to usually do the Paul thing. We'd like to have the Paul results, but there's no Paul results without the Paul thing. And so this is how it happens. So God's saying, hey, there's Job. Have you considered him? Verse 9. The so Satan says to God that. Now here's another interesting thing. It seems like sinfulness can be in the presence of God. Have you ever heard, like, we can't, God is so holy that we can't be in his presence unless we're holy and completely sinless? It's, it seems like there's a lot of sinful things around him. So that's kind of interesting, isn't it? The thing is, is in, the Bible says even, even God is in heaven. He's everywhere. He's omni-what? present. 
that's a whole other conversation that's kind of mind-blowing. But the thing is, we have to be like him to have fellowship with him. That's what transformation is all about. That's why God works in our life to bring about transformation, because he's making likeness. And our likeness to God brings about fellowship. That's We're like that just in our relationships. We're usually closer to people. It's easier to be friends with people we have a lot in common with. But likeness brings about closeness, and so that's why God works through transformation. But we see these evil, angelic hosts, even Satan, right there with, with God. And so Satan, he says, yeah, does Job fear you for nothing, God? What's basically his, his challenge is, what's the point of having faith? He says, he's, he's saying and accusing God and Job, saying, that's not even a real faith. Why? Verse 10 Haven't you made a hedge around him and his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, his possessions have increased in the land. He said, Anybody would love you if they had awesome family and awesome material possessions and of course anybody would. Satan saying, what's I'm not impressed, what's the big deal about that? And I always thought, man, that whole hedge thing, you know, when people pray to have a hedge of protection around me, I'm always uncomfortable with that. It's like that just seems so wimpy. Like I, I don't want a hedge around me. I want a fortress around me. But the hedge here is different than our little hedges around our lawn or whatever. The hedges here were, they were walls of hedges. They were basically impenetrable. They were large and thick, and there were rows of them. So don't get that little picture that I've had for a long time just really bummed me out. Like a dog can jump over my hedge. I, mean, I don't feel very safe if I just have a little hedge around my house. But basically, the point is, he's saying, that's not real faith at all. Isn't that true, though? I mean, it's that would be easy faith if, you know, I'll become a Christian, and then everything will be great, and I'll have all this stuff, and God will be my genie in the bottle, and I'll just rub it, and voila, new car, new house, new job, new whatever. And that's how we can think sometimes. But that's not real faith. So, in verse 11, he says, Now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and then he'll curse you to your face. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of agitate some of his stuff and see how he flips out. That's like, like us, how we can just praise the Lord, and then our car breaks down. Oh, come on, God! <laughs> Jeez, are you kidding me? That's, but that, that's what he's saying. He's saying everything is good as long as everything is good. But real faith is proven in the fire. So in verse 12, he says, The Lord said to Satan, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. There's the boundary. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So now, now he has a job. It's interesting that God often uses Satan to accomplish his purposes. And so now we have the scene set. Job is oblivious to this. That's the advantage we have. Imagine Job. And he was probably a guy around the patriarchal time, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, era. He, didn't, he doesn't know what's going on. 
But is it that that's not so with us sometimes? We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Didn't uh, Jesus say to Peter, Satan has asked for you? And you know, we just don't know when that knock's going to come, when that phone call comes, that person walks out the door, when that doctor gives us that diagnosis. We don't know. And those are the things in life that are so hard. And we find here, we find this working behind the scenes. And we find God orchestrating these events and using Satan sort of as his pawn. And you know, we find something that God saw, saw in Job something that was so valuable. Well, he saw this faith in him. He saw this hunger and this desire for God himself that God granted him the gift to know him in a deeper way through the suffering. Isn't that interesting? So those of us who say, Lord, I just hunger for you, I desire for you, I love you, Lord, that often the Lord will answer that through buffeting, through attacks, through opportunities to know God better. Job was gifted with his suffering because God wanted to do in a faithful servant something in Job's life that was so magnificent and so important that it would make all the suffering worth it. And notice all the people that were bypassed for this. You may say, well, I definitely wouldn't want to be those guys. I don't fly under the radar. I wouldn't want to. But see, this is a gift. This is a reward. That God looked at Job and he said, Job, he loves me and I love him. And I want to take that love and that relationship to a whole other level. And this is how you do it. And so we're going to take communion tonight. We're just going to finish right there. So we lay the foundation for this understanding. May we come to a place as we come to the Lord's table. where we could have the all-consuming passion of our life would be to, to know God in a deeper way.